Uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that everybody wants to know more about church records. I hope you all know me. I'm Marsha Grubb, and I'm not only a librarian and your speaker for this morning, I am the educational director. And most of you know I'm here all the time in the library because obviously I have no other life, which is not exactly true because since we're moving up the street, and Lois is here, great. <laughs> Um, we are able to allow me to indulge my other passion, which is gardening, because we're going to be cleaning up all the landscaping. So uh, we have a sign-up book for that project, and if you can help in any way, put your name on one of the lists, and we'll email you and, and see what you can do. Come November, it'll be a big deal, but little things are going on. My little um, advertising for the moment um, of our other projects. Today we're going to be talking about researching American, United States church records. We shouldn't just say United States church records because in reality church records in the New World really began about 1600. Um, Historically speaking, I believe we all kind of know the Puritans left England for religious freedom in about 1620. That era of arriving in the Americas is called the Great Migration, and you know, the library has a lot of great uh, resources on the shelf. The Irish, you know, and those were Puritans but we would consider them uh, Protestants, or even more specifically, uh, they're the modern-day congregational uh, denominations. And then the I we vaguely know the Irish potato famine forced many poor Irish Catholics to flee their homeland from about 1845. Um, but really, religious relocation is a rather more complex situation. And it didn't just happen in those iconic times that we seem to have learned in our history books. Uh, but no matter where or when or why our ancestors arrived, those churches kept records. Church records from the onset happened. Um, and while most U.S. vital records are now kept at the county level, it wasn't always that way, certainly. It was rather hit or miss. Up on the shelf is the Red Book. And when you're looking for ancestors, Go there on the Red Book. C could you get the Red Book, one of you? Oh, thanks. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Can't miss it. This information is also available. Yeah, just give it to whomever. <laughs> uh, it's just a reminder. This information is like so basic. When you come in and you have a roadblock, it's like going back to the basics is a good reminder. This is also digitally available. The book was written by Ancestry. They quit putting paper editions out, I believe, because it's all on Ancestry Wiki. The same sort of information is available on Family Search on the Wiki. But what it tells you, go to any state in there and read it, and it tells you where all the records are found in that state. There's a chart for every county. It will tell you when that county in that state began keeping records. This in the book, uh, the 19th century, the United States was really getting organized and the local uh, governmental agencies got organized about keeping records. But vaguely, generally, prior to 1890s, uh, if you couldn't get a governmental record, the next best place was 
church records because church records were keeping records way back. We never had a central or we were never were, our country never was. We, we founding fathers, separation of church and state. So we didn't, America, United States did not have a central church. So there wasn't just one church, which you, we now know why we have so many. European countries usually did have a central church or a new, uh, in England, it's the Church of England or the Anglican Church. Um, the queen is the head, also the head of the church. Um, but that was the central authority. And the churches, wherever in England and Great Britain, the church had records. They kept records. They also uh, informed central authority, the governmental or secular body. So while our ancestors may have departed and come to America, often they immigrated with their native church affiliations. So one of the clues to finding things is if they left England, possibly they were Anglican or Protestant Episcopal when they got to the New World. If they left Ireland, possibly they were Catholic, Church of Ireland, which was Northern Ireland, or Anglican. The Scots were Presbyterian, Church of Scotland, or Episcopal, or Anglican. The Welsh were Church of England, Anglican, or Episcopal. The German and Swiss, they were in the North, they were Lutheran. In the South, they were Catholic, or they were, were Reformed. Can we get that information? <laughs> yeah. You're getting the same thing. That would be really awesome if we could get that. You guys want so much. That's why I gave you a handout so you could take notes. But you're going too fast. I will share. I will share. Yeah. Thank you. I will share in the end. I didn't know how much she wanted. Um, the French, of course, we know were pretty much Catholic, but they also were Protestant in the Huguenots. Uh, the reason I put this on is I wanted to go more specifically about, um, I think, in my view, I felt like churches were like, you know, rather modern buildings <laughs> it, down the street uh, with big parking lots. The interesting thing about Clark County is, historically speaking, um, religion came in the Hudson Bay area era. Um, the French fur traders didn't have a church to go to. And so they petitioned, and here in Clark County, um, they petitioned the, the Hudson Bay Company in Quebec where they had an office and said, hey, we need some, some religion here. And um, from Quebec, two priests were sent to the Oregon country. The Catholic Church in the Pacific Northwest's arrival was rife with drama. It involved not only the Hudson Bay Company, but the Esther Short family, the U.S. Army, and the Pope. So. When the, the request came for some sort of organized religion presence, two priests were sent, came out here, Francois Norbert Blanchet and Modeste Demur. They arrived in Fort Vancouver and they held masses in various buildings within the Hudson Bay Fort. By 1845, Blanchet gained HBC permission to build a wooden church right outside of the existing fort, which we know is not exactly where it is now. And it was dedicated, the wooden structure, in 1846. By 1846, the Vatican also established three Catholic dioceses in Oregon country. An Oregon country was not only Oregon and Washington, it went clear up beyond, I think, just the Sitka, Alaska, went way up, included, of course, what we now know as British Columbia. 
These three dioceses were Oregon City, Vancouver Island, and Walla Walla. Well, Walla Walla was abandoned because of the Whitman massacre. Uh, Father Blanchet a attempted to go to Walla Walla and things were rather tense. So he returned. And then uh, in 1850, he returned to Vancouver. The Pope established the Diocese of Nesqually with an NES, which was headquartered in Vancouver. Um, the fathers uh, held their masses in the wooden church outside the fort for many years. They came, they went, and by the 1880s, a Belgian father, pastor, arrived, and he had visions of a monumental edifice to praise God. And by uh, November 1st, 1885, the cathedral that we know, oopsie, not the picture, the cathedral that we know, coming back, in Vancouver, was dedicated. What year was that? 1885. You can still go there. What's interesting about it is it's a bit of history, and I would say that wherever you go searching Catholic records, look for the churches, maybe a cathedral, they have records. So I did call the office. Um, we have Catholic friends here and I said Dolly you go to that church no well I don't go to St. James I go to St. Joseph because well Father Harris is rather old-fashioned and he doesn't think um, that we should stand when we're getting communion that you have to get on your knees and I'm getting old about that and I'm going okay but can I call him oh yeah just call the office so I did I called the office and I found out which I did put on there that they have the records books from 1838 that was before the cathedral was built it was even prior to the wooden structure being up but they kept records you can get records in Clark County if you feel you have any ancestors that were here in those pioneer times. On request, you just mail, email them to uh, Sandy Campanera is the Pastoral Assistant for Administration and Stewardship and the parish priest is the Reverend W.R. Harris, but they will search the records for you. You can't go and touch the books. But you, these records are there, and I'm going, wow. I'm using this because I, I'm, I'm thinking most parish churches around the country are likely similar. They have offices. They have people. You can call them. Uh, you can talk to them. You can, you can get information. Some, according to the shows, let you touch the books, but not all. It really depends on the person in charge of the church. Exactly. In Toledo, Ohio. None of it. They don't have the time. They don't have the interest. It's a, well. <laughs> and that's where my wife's family's from, so. I can tell you I got an insider's view of the parish priest that when they arrive, they do things their way, yep. and when they leave, the next guy does yeah, it differently. <laughs> And I'm going, well, that's very interesting. So I did talk to him, and I was invited. So um, I went over. This is, um, I got another picture of, with my car at the, the foot of the steps. But that is the south-facing view of the cathedral. The east-facing view now has 
uh, a C-Tran bus stop in mm. front of it. It's, what street is that on? That's 12th. It's 2 12th. The east side is Washington. Oh. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Oh, I see. That's 12th Street. Oh. It's, uh, uh, um, you go down Washington, which is the one-way street, which is the east street, and there's a bus stop there, which is not very impress impressive. And I thought, well, why did they let that? And then I realized that this is the address. So you can go up the stairs, and if you go to the left, uh, past that um, rhododendron there, they have a garden, and you can go in the gate and the grounds. Or you visit any time. So if you go to the website, and I put it uh, on there, I think I put it on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you can look at the history. There's more to it than what I'm passing along. It's probably a whole other class. I have touched upon the, the land grab by the Hudson Bay Company, the church, Esther Short family, the U.S. Army that they wrangled in, in before 1850 in Vancouver. It's pretty interesting. But that, and that, that, that this cathedral exists at all is sort of amazing. And it was sort of getting it built. It was like waiting for people who were problem, troublesome to die. The Esther Short family, Esther Short died. Her name's on everything, but she died and her children wouldn't give up. I mean, so Esther Short wrangled over land in that part of Vancouver for the family for at least 40 years. 40 years. When did she die? About? I think, I think 1853. But she was... Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, her husband died in a boat accident way before, and she is the one that made the land grant claims. Yeah. I was surprised. I thought she lived forever. Her name lives forever. Her name lives forever. That's true. So if you, if you want to visit, I mean, I, I just feel like this is sort of a time capsule on what probably other uh, communities have and things. There are artifacts. This is a cool historic church. There are a lot newer churches, Catholic churches in America, I'm sure. But this is kind of cool. And there are artifacts in there. And so if you read along, it tells about the, the priests, the pioneers that came to this, this town. Um, essentially, um, Vancouver was A wild town. It was a frontier town. It, they they had pretensions of of uh, society, but things were rip roaring. People people came and there were land grabs and they were they were busy folks in many ways. But go visit the church and get an idea. And if you want to. Uh, Find, if you want to research, you have possibilities, um, and the uh, Sandy is the one that will talk to people. So they seem to be very organized in this church, not like Larry's. Is that for the whole county? They have records? No. Churches are not divided by counties. They are divided by parishes. Is it for and every diocese. parish in the county, since it's a cathedral? It is not a cathedral in the diocese okay. of Seattle or Nesqually anymore. It, it is, the title is, and I gave it to you, it's important, it is the Proto-Cathedral of St. James the Greater. Proto-Cathedral means that it was the cathedral of the Diocese of Nesqually, N-E-S, until 1907. After Mother Joseph passed away, the uh, priests, the powers to be, um, campaigned and got the diocese moved up to Seattle. 
So now the Cathedral of Se Seattle, which is also a St. James, I believe, is where uh, the, the seat of the diocese is. So they have different names. And, and then also, because I know they're at their Catholic Church, because people go to St. James and people go to St. Joseph's, uh, the one that's on Andreessen. The one where the famous for the sausage fest, which they don't do anymore. Oh, but you know the Elks in Towns is having an Elktoberfest. <laughs> <laughs> so the Catholics' um, denominations in America, they were in Florida in 1565. They were in the Southwest in 1598. So, um, and I go, why was that? Well, the conquistadors, the Spanish, were in the Southwest. And um, Maryland, they were there by 1649. Louisiana, they were in the 1700s. And the Catholics have very good records because they, they baptized the children. The marriage records was, you know, you had to get the priest in on it. And of course, burial records. And so, in the secular world, we call it births, marriages, and death. So, and there is, there are subtle differences in the baptism records and birth records because it wasn't always the exact same day. The same with death and burial records, not exactly the same day. But there again, it's close, and for genealogical records, it's, it's useful information. So of course, the Catholics aren't the only people that arrived in the New World. Um, I gave you, I know I gave you, share with you, a list of other denominations. The Baptists started in Rhode Island <laughs> in the colonial era. And so the Baptists were the strong, uh, and I noticed in the research that not only did your ancestors, where they came from, had something to do with their religions. Where they went, where they ended up might also. Uh, the denominations uh, tended to congregate. But again, that is not a hard, fast rule. It's a clue. Um, the Church of England began in Virginia. Now, the Church of England, which is more Catholic and uh, Episcopal, Protestant Episcopal, there began in Virginia because that was Jamestown was there. A lot of Englishmen invested in Jamestown. So they were there prior to 1620, I think. What is it, 1609? in Jamestown. They have really good records if they survive. I can imagine that records in Jamestown are sparse because they had a lot of issues. And they also had a Roanoke was in Virginia was another settlement in the very early times. It did not survive at all. Oh, sure. a, lot of, a lot of records that were originally in Jamestown for those times, can be found in the Army Post, I think, at Haggertown, Pennsylvania. How did they get there? Well, during the Great War of the Rebellion, the winning side took a bunch of records north and have since refused to return them I will, of as course. spores of oil. Of Ooh. course not. You know if, you're in vet, if you're really in, going to have to investigate people's Jamestown, <coughs> You may have to take a trip to Pennsylvania. <coughs> Interesting. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Well, I, I all, one of the corollaries to me in genealogy, if I heard about a town or an area in my high school or college history class, typically those areas have a great deal more genealogical interests and records. So that's kind of a plus. 
And then people do cool things and they go, oh, I found this and I know my people were there. But, oh, they went someplace. And you find out these marvelous tidbits of, oh, yeah, it's not quite there. So, cool one. So we don't need to look at that. If you want to turn that on. Too late. Too late, okay. So the Church of England is also known as the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Church of Wales, the Church of Ireland, and the Protestant Episcopal Church, and the Episcopal Church. And what I noticed is while I found pages of denominations and dioceses and parishes and, and this and that, I think in the 20th century, in the 21st century, churches seem nowadays to invent their own names. <laughs> and I was looking around Vancouver and I'm going, really? Really? That's an interesting name for a church. There's a church here that's an aspire. Aspire. Now I'm, I'm trying to figure out, now what denomination did that come from? I haven't a clue, but the names of churches in the 20th century are much more diverse. And so I'm not sure going forward if that's going to be as helpful to our descendants. But uh, the next church on the list is Church of Latter-day Saints, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the Mormons. We're very much in aware of the Mormon church because as genealogists, who of us has not gone to the Family History Center, who has not gone <laughs> to FamilySearch.org, and who among us is scheduled to go visit the great font in Salt Lake City of all things record-wise of our ancestors. They gather everybody's records, <coughs> and they have been doing it for years. How many years? I'm not exactly sure uh, when, we, when we all came aware of it. But I was aware of it because my uncle married into a Mormon family, and next thing I know, they're all gathering records, and I'm going, oh, that's really interesting. But specifically, um, the Mormon church started in 1830 in New York, and... Who was it that came west and had Young? great adventures? Was that Young? Was it Brigham? Brigham Young. Brigham Young. He traveled west and he found, I'm not quite sure, I always ask questions, why Salt Lake? To me that's just fascinating. Um, my people went to Southern California, you know, I think it was a little warmer, had a few more trees, <laughs> who knows. Uh, but by 1850, most uh, Mormons were congregated in uh, Utah, and by 1900, the West, Western states were the most fully populated with Mormons. They didn't really stay in the East. Congregationalist, um, I wondered what the pilgrims became. Apparently, they became congregationalists. And I noticed that early on uh, reading William Bradford and Winthrop, uh, both men of, of the uh, Great Migration, they wrote journals in the time. And then when you're looking, and I have ancestors in Massachusetts, in Sandwich. And there is conversation, there's, there's a book on the shelf, uh, the, the town in Massachusetts, Sandwich, and they talk about their congregational, congregationalist churches. So I think very early on they may have uh, changed their name from Puritans or, pil well, they never were called pilgrims, they were Puritans. Uh, but their official start was 1620 with the Puritans. They're strong in the colonial era and in, in they spread out in New England. Became the State Church of Connecticut until 1818. 
Uh, they, the Congregationalists also included separatists um, and some of these separatist groups where they branched off became uh, Disciples of Christ or the Congregational Christian Churches, the United Church of Christ, the Unitarian Universalist Association. So those kinds of church uh, came from Congregational beginnings. Uh, the Dutch reform can I just, yeah the, and that they they were English the Puritans pretty much but you know once they arrived well I think they mostly were English what what I notice when I read William Bradford the these people seeking religious freedoms um, were pretty demanding that people coming in the community, you were either part of the church or you moved on. So I, I'm sure that attitude, and Winthrop and Bradford were that way. I would argue that it was not so much for religious freedom, it was for religion our way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because in, particularly in Massachusetts, if you were a Quaker, you were asked twice to leave, if you didn't leave by the third time, you could be hung. And in fact, the last Quaker hung in Massachusetts was a lady hung in, in, the, in, in the Boston Commons. So <clears throat> they didn't have a lot of empathy for those that they asked to be non-believers. I can tell you on our shelf sandwich, they talk about the Quakers that were shot in Boston. Yeah. I mean, Sandwich was more tolerant. The town of Sandwich was more see, that, tolerant. That's farther out, and that's more towards where the the original pilgrims landed down in the Cape. I was in Sandwich. Yeah, it was. Boston is where more of the Winthrop people landed. The more Boston was where the Winthrop people, people landed. landed. Pil uh, Plymouth was further south, and then Sandwich right. was down there. And yeah. for a long time, there were two competing colonies. Oh, yeah. Those on the Cape and those in the city of Boston are real close around. I would further <coughs> argue from what I keep reading is that my ancestors, Benjamin Nye and his group arrived in 1635, Thomas Tupper. They arrived, they hung around, and I feel in my own that um, they petitioned Plymouth Colony, Bradford, to leave because they thought it was rather stifling. But the reality is you couldn't just leave without permission because Plymouth claimed, I mean, they're sitting here on a little space, but they like claimed all the land. And if you wanted to start another town and in that further away, you had to negotiate with the powers that be at Plymouth. Same with Boston. Yeah. If you wanted to start another town, you had to talk with the Winthrop guys. Well, well that's where a lot of the New England colonies far in the south got to start. A number of my ancestors landed with Winthrop in Boston. Oh, yeah. And they and Thomas Hooker and a whole bunch of them were as politely to pack up and go south. So they wound up in Connecticut. And I have another group of them that were tolerated in Boston for a while. Broke some rules, imagine that, running a <laughs> running a one-room bar. Mm -hmm. And he was asked ultimately to go clear down to Rhode Island before he could, yes. he could settle. It's yeah. fascinating yeah. that they came here for religious freedom, but they didn't allow, allow someone else to have no, their freedom. It's, yeah. it's, <laughs> you can drive a Mayflower person nuts, and I do, by just saying, it's not religious freedom, it's religion our way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, actually, it was an investment. Every one well, of them true, was yeah. consumed with, with making returning money. the money. And the Mayflower was not all religious dissidents. Half of them were investors. And the, really? the, at least the Billington family was, here's your choice. You're poor, you have no money, you're in prison, the whole family was in prison, 
So you can either stay in prison because you owe money, or you can take this boat and go to the New World. Um. As an indentured something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that's where a lot of them came over. There, was, there were a number of, and I can't remember the names off my head, but there were a number of indentured servants that also came over. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, <coughs> so the Congregationalists, uh, if you have English, you, you might look into those churches. The Dutch Reform were in the United States in New York, New York City in the mid-1600s. And I'm uh, thinking uh, uh, of uh, Sleepy Hollow. Who is that? Ichabod Crane. Ichabod Crane. And, and that author, I went to his house on the Hudson River. And uh, the Hudson River in the fall can be kind of stark and eerie and cool. And you can just see where he wrote. I, I, I walked in the house where he wrote all his books. Washington Irving. Well, he also wrote Astoria. Uh, but anyway, uh, fascinating, fascinating part of the world. And so you can kind of think that these Dutch people were kind of cool. Uh, interesting. They have a nuns that New York City. Yeah. I don't know. That the Dutch. The yeah. Dutch, yeah. Yeah, the Dutch settled New York City. They bought Long Island for 12 bucks of beans yeah, and there stuff. You go. <laughs> and uh, they have, they, if you have ancestors that came with the Dutch, they have excellent records that's available. A lot of them are available online. Um, yeah, that's, they took meticulous care of the folks in there. And then the Dutch lost it to the English in, the, in one of the wars they had. Oh, yeah, the English, the English. One guy came over in 1660, and uh, the, the uh, Dutch records are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The Dutch Reformed Church. And, and so where do you go for those records? To well, we'll get, we'll get we'll there. Get there. Okay. Um, the Dutch spread into New Jersey, and of course they, these immigrants came from the Netherlands. The German pietists, I love this name, which is the Mennonites, Dunkards, Brethren, and Amish. They were in Pennsylvania by the 1700s, and I believe they they are still exist Mennonite and Amish settlements, mostly in Pennsylvania. Has anybody else found yeah, that? So. Yeah, yeah. Ohio. Yeah. Ohio. Yeah, Middle Southern Ohio. Ohio. Southern Ohio. Southern Ohio. That Indiana. kind of area. Yeah. I don't know about the Dunkards or the Brethren. Um, they might be small. I can't remember Ohio. which one of them, but there were a couple of those groups that came over that didn't believe in. Propagating. Yes. So <laughs> yes. after a while, they tended, to, they tended to die. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't believe in conjugal cohabitation, apparently. Is there any, uh, you get a feel for how organized these little churches were? It sounds like there's, uh, that, that there are so many splinter groups that uh, just they formed to do it their way. I wonder how organized they were. Well, if they got a, if they got somebody, uh, I feel like if they had somebody who had money and could build them a house of God with hard benches to sit on, they were organized. Yeah. And then they started. But but as far as records go, it, it can get to be sort of a crapshoot. Because if they didn't continue, who kept the records? Yeah. You know, you you have just dealing with one of my ancestors. He. Someplace along the ride, he became a Baptist preacher. Well, then he left New York and traveled into um, Missouri in about 1830 or so, and was a traveling preacher. And what kind of records would he keep? And who would have him? I mean, and, and again, you wonder, well, what denomination of Baptists did he belong to? He just was the broad category of a Baptist preacher. And we found, I found some records on him, but nothing that really tell me definitive who he married, who his kids were. And this is, you know, he's a preacher. You think he'd baptize his kids. Well, where are those records? So he started a church in northeastern Missouri, and as he traveled down to the central, he just kept starting churches, and when they became viable in those days, he'd appoint, here's the preacher, and off he'd go, and he'd start another church. 
so as those towns, some of them died out, where those records Where did the go? real estate go, though? Yeah, it's, it's, some of them are just owned by the county or whomever. I mean, it's just there, is there a couple no, of little ghost towns. Just Well, is there no chain of records someplace? No, no. Uh, well, that's, yeah, well, and course, that's the... And Missouri had an issue during the War of the Great Rebellion. I mean, it, it, we we all I think recognize that if records survive, it's more of a miracle than, than we anything know. else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jewish congregations uh, arrived in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Jewish mostly from Eastern European countries, especially Austria and Russia. They tended to um, settle in large cities. Uh, if you're looking in the uh, Family History Library catalog, they are cataloged as Jewish records. Uh, metrical books are registry books where births, marriage, deaths, and divorces were recorded. And so you can also do uh, metrical books search for Jewish records. My daughter married into a Jewish family in New York City, and you can go to the temple. She did not convert, um, but my daughter believes in in supporting her her husband's family, understanding that. This was a match made in heaven because this family not only celebrates every Jewish holiday, they also ce celebrate every Christian holiday. <laughs> Everyone. So, but um, Dana knows the rabbi in their neighborhood. They have a huge, they live in close to Lincoln Center and there is a huge Jewish temple. And she goes in and she actually, my daughter, actually, made some sort of, of altar thing for the rabbi as a, as a favor to him. And he wrote her name in the book for some reason. And I'm going, well, that was very nice. Um, but they, the Jewish people, too, part of their structure of their religion, which is very old, technically 5,000 years, I guess, um, they keep records, and the downside is they have, we all know, encountered great uh, disasters and <laughs> records are burned. So if you have Eastern European families, uh, ancestors, um, and along the Adriatic area too, where a lot of Jewish people fled, um, records and families and things are problematic um, and that's the way it is. But, the, but I watch the shows and apparently not everything is gone. And we'll get to the what do you do when you, when you can't find anything online. Uh, but next is a Lutheran church. It was started uh, in Pennsylvania in the 1700s. And it arrived from German and Scandinavian immigrants. We have a Lutheran church here in Vancouver. We've got a bunch of them. Yeah. But I believe there's one that was started in the 1800s, right? Is that right? Boy, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the Vancouver that well. <laughs> They, and, well, uh, James at the museum, it's the church he goes to, and I go, really, it's that old? And uh, it's kind of cool. So uh, I would imagine in our own county, there's uh, a historic Catholic presence, but there's also a rather historic Lutheran presence. And I'm not sure about the other denominations in Clark County, but the Methodists, arrived um, about 1850, well, no, they didn't arrive, but by 1850, the Methodists, about a third of American Protestants were considered Methodists. So whether they uh, arrived from someplace doesn't seem to be their past. It seems to be Protestants 
Protestants wanted to define their denomination more fully. Um, from 1820 to 1920, Methodism was considered the largest Protestant denomination. So, uh, sounds like a, f a trend to be a Methodist. I remember when I was a child, my mother took us to the Baptist church, and it was a brown, dark, gothic, uh, gothic spire looking church. It wasn't a big church, but it had a spire. And um, you could look down the street, and there was this white Methodist. It looked like a Greek temple. And <laughs> it sort of shaded my view of what kind of people they were. <laughs> and I really, I really didn't go to either of them over much, but I noticed that. I was, that was very young. Um, the Society of Friends, or Quakers, they began in the 1600s, and they came to the United States from England, Wales, and Germany, which sort of surprises me in an odd way, I'm not sure. After the Revolution, uh, many Quakers left the southern states and went to Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Uh, the Friends, the Society of Friends, they, they do have uh, uh, congregations out here in the West. Uh, I have a good friend who, who is Quaker. Um, I don't know about you, but I find there are people that just go to church and it's not a big topic of conversation. But they're uh, strongest in Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, New England, mid-Atlantic states, southern, especially North Carolina. But I would say they're also out here in the West in fair numbers. The uh, hmm? Is the meeting house in Kansas? That might be where Jim goes. P could you say again the Pennsylvania, North Carolina? Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia, New England, mid-Atlantic states, okay. the southern, ex especially North Carolina. Welcome. Just me. Just me. <laughs> um, <coughs> now, how do we find these? These are all the things you can do. I feel that I am surprised when people know their family affiliation religiously. <coughs> I watch the shows, and Tom Bergeron. They did a fabulous show on who do you think you are, and his whole family was Catholic. There's no doubt about it. They were French Catholics, and he knew that. He knew, and Bergeron, he's of the male line, Bergeron, Bergeron, and so I feel that you're fortunate if you have that sort of identity. You know, I don't have that at all, really. Um, I just don't. But. I feel like the family members in my family tree often are women, and of course women's name change. So you, we don't have that sort of direct. I, I do know my birth name. I do know they go back uh, to Maryland, 1700. I, I do do that, but I, I don't particularly identify. So I'm thinking, how do you know where your people went to church? D does everybody? have a good grasp on that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are all smarter than me. <laughs> no. I, but you asked. I have ministers in South See, you have ministers. Yeah. I had no ministers. None of that. But where do you find that? Your family. Your family, where did they go to church? If you didn't talk about it, most people didn't. You just went to church. And where did you most go? Well, that's a good source. To me, that's the beginning source. Before the advent of the motor vehicle, from what I, particularly if you're in a small town, that was a social life. The closest church mm -hmm. is generally where they would go, mm -hmm. and even though they may not be that denomination, they still may go to that church for the things like marriages, baptisms, and those kind of things because 
That's where you went to look That's for where you wife. Went. Now, if you're back a generation or two and in the hinterlands, you may be living with your spouse for a year before the traveling preacher comes along and exactly. makes it official. Exactly. So then that becomes a little more problematic as to where did they go to church? Who's the closest one? Who's the guy who rode around on the horseback? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, where did his records go? Made notes in his little notebook. Yeah, made and notes in his notebook. little and, notebook. And where did that go? Where did that go? So well, I can tell you, when I lived in Texas, it was a revelation. Folks around, young folks, went to church. Two places they went looking for for spouses was church and family reunions. So, so and the and the amazing thing, I guess, to the from my point of view as a, as a kid growing up, they all tended to work together. Oh yeah. Um, the LDS church sponsored all the Boy Scout stuff. The community church was sponsoring a lot of the Girl Scout stuff. And there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of, well you have to belong to join. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember a lot of, well you really need to get involved in the church if no. he just, he just, it was, you know, of course in the old days. It was a pretty good way to grow up. Yeah. 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 But again, you know, where are you going to go for the record? I mean, it's... But. Marcia? Yes, sir. Did your family know all of, the, all of your history back to the 1700s or 1600s? No, my sister and I have dug it. So you've all, it, it's a matter of you guys have dug it out rather than the family passed it on? The people my father identified didn't go to church with. You know, no. my, my father was impressed with his dad, who, uh, he was a, a decorated war hero of World War I, but he was a salesman. He married my grandmother, they have two sons, and he left his wife, my dear grandmother, for his blonde, floozy receptionist. <laughs> <laughs> my, his father, and, and I wondered, well, why was Grandpa Henry that way? Well then, his father, Meredith, my great-grandfather, he, he was the bigamist. My grandfather was the product of um, Meredith's second marriage and he was still married to the first she lived in Spokane and they married in New Hampshire and my great-grandmother was from Martha's Vineyard my grandfather is the middle of three sons from a bigamous marriage yeah so and and my father thought these people were strong sorts of people so I'm feeling like you know my father did not relate to people who went to church, so that part of my family, that wasn't the way it was. And I was surprised to learn much later that my mother's people were Catholic, because my mother did not go to the Catholic church, but she always wore the cross. So, I, I, there are clues in our family stories, but beyond the clues, we have to figure out what kind of records we're going to get from church records. So, um, church records come in numbers of sources, and I did put on, on the list. Again, we talked about it with the Catholics. The church records and the information you find on baptisms or christenings are different than uh, government birth records that you get in the hospital. Um, and what are you going to find on that? You're going to find, uh, of course, name of the child, the place of birth, the christening, the name of the parents, the name of sponsors, godparents, witnesses who are often relatives. Confirmations. I don't think Catholic Church, I don't think that's the only ones that do that, right? So confirmations are another place that you might find records. Marriage records. Marriage records 
are um, full of great information. And in that regard, Dolly loaned me church records. This is church record, the actual church record. Oh, beautiful. Oh. Peter Petras and Rosa Riederhold. These are her grandparents. Mm -hmm. Wow, she trusted you. <laughs> <laughs> we know the right people. But these are the pictures. And so that is the lovely certificate that, that the church. But here's the record in the book of this marriage and the people involved. Where's the St. Joseph Church in Portland? Where's that? Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, Dolly grew up in Portland. So they so they put the pictures in the official church record? No, no, no. D this is Dolly's compilation. Oh, that's Dolly's? Okay. Yeah. All the church had was a, a line in a book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, and the other thing is, what are you going to get? Um, she's Catholic, and so she said all the records, even in America, are in Latin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Until very recently, they're in Latin. In the Catholic Church. Yeah, so e what this is... Except for French Canada. Mm -hmm. French Canada's in French. Wait. <laughs> but you have people to tell you, oh, they're all Latin. So you try to get someone that reads Latin to read it for you? No. I managed to stumble onto a guy who's since passed away, but he was a World War II French veteran living in Florida, and he read all of his stuff for us and transcribed it over. So the church records were in French? In French Canada. In and French Canada. French? Oh. In French Canada. French Canadian oh, yeah. is a little bit different than uh, yeah. French. <laughs> Even the, the Latin in the Catholic Church is a scramble of a mixture of English and uh, Latin in the English-speaking country. I think this one is <coughs> in Latin. Uh, I think these are these are three baptism records. So <coughs> she has a bunch of cool records. And and like everything, what she's found in her search, then her book here is marriage. Um, is that the church books records are often preprinted <coughs> forms. And amazingly, when I found a marriage record of my ancestor in very well uh, at they uh, they married in Gilmer County, Georgia, and like within the first five years of that beginning, they were like one of the very first records, and yet the book had printed stuff, and they filled in stuff, which I thought was kind of like, well now. But again, uh, if you were a new county in North Georgia, it wasn't the first county founded in Georgia. And people came from other uh, areas that had infrastructure of how to set up a government. So people getting married paid a fee, and you filled it out, and that's a way to generate money for a clerk. But the other thing is, that is really nice writing, but you look on the other one mm -hmm. with the pictures, the writing is problematic. And so in this book, you guys want to look in? She has records of inter interments, interments, and other kinds of records. But these are all. Um, and her grandmother came from Eastern European countries um, around the Adriatic. So uh, the other kind of records that are kind of interesting is, um, remember, the marriage records, you get the name of the bride, the groom, the date of the marriage, age, residence of the bride and groom at the time they, they applied, witnesses, bondsmen, 
They may or may not be relatives, so you, you particularly should look at each one. Nice if they had pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, she yeah. dug those out. Yeah. That's great. She, she put that together. I don't think my family. Um, anyway, death records. <laughs> outside of the a lady on a, a thing I opined that, um, you know, you can pay to get a death record. You really ought to get it. Now, the death record you're going to pay for is typically a, a governmental record if it exists. But she said, you really ought to get it. But the same thing applies. Death records, you should look at the whole thing. And... Um, Death records in the church will be the burial records, but even at that, they probably have the name of the deceased, date of the burial, and the place, the age. It might give the date of the death and the place and the name of the spouse or the parents. Sometimes the, the death record even gives the birth record. Um, sometimes they put that they died up over here in the Old City Cemetery, that they died, they were 74 years, three months, and 12 days mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, why didn't they just say they were born? <laughs> <laughs> they would have had to figure it out themselves. Oh, yeah, they would have had to do the math, I'm sure. But um, again, like, even like, secular records in the government, it's not consistent. But I find when the biggest thing, when I'm looking online, I forget to look at all the little, little things. And Dolly and I pointed out in here, one of the things is, um, read every line. Because often, it's a bad habit, I go, oh yeah, that's mom and dad, oh yeah, that's the kid who cares about the rest can't read it anyway. But there might be a gold mine of clues in there. Is that supposed to be a copy of the original or is that a transcription? No, it's a copy of the original document. Uh, and, and another thing, keep in mind when they go research for you and you can't look at the books. I think Dolly looked at the books with the help of somebody. You got the same error problem with the transcriptions and all Yeah, so you, you have to, to uh, it's nice to look at. It's hard to read, but they took a copy and they certified that this was uh, a micro, apparently this was my that she got. I have my grandfather's baptism record from the church. It was a transcribed later when I requested it. And it lists his birth year is 1871. And he was born January 1st. He was born in 72, but of course we all forget to change the year when the mm. year changes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's wrong. So Dolly points out that this picture, which is a little, it's been on the wall, she said in Catholic families, this is really important stuff. And she says, yes, it's mostly a picture of you know who, but it is the remembrance of the First Holy Communion and Frank Keyes. I think this is her father, received First Holy Communion and St. Peter's Church, June 7, 1925. Now, that is information because that tells you where he was when he was there. And that confirms things. And of course, Father Flynn was the pastor. So, And he probably had a brogue, the pastor. You probably you probably would know, but but at any point, it's a reminder, and Dolly reminded me to look at, think about what the information is telling you that's not printed out in big bold print. Um, church records also may have sexton records. They may have cemetery plot what is, maps. What is that? Sexton records. It's somebody who does something in the church. Oh. Caretaker. Caretaker. Yeah, the lands. Uh, I noticed on at St. Uh, James, they have a guy who is the pastoral assistant and sextant. But they also had a custodian. 
So I don't think, I think it's somebody who knows about the lands. And a sexton may be a person who keeps the record about the property. And if it is a church that also has a burial ground, and in uh, 17th, 18th century, that's often where people were buried, is next to the church. You could differentiate a sexton from a custodian. Uh, Sexton primarily would be ecclesiastical type stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The clergy, mm -hmm. uh, the custodians. Swept the floor. Yeah, yeah. Not custodian of records, so, yeah. <laughs> and and I, believe, I would say, truly, if somebody had a title in the 17th or 18th century of custodian, don't assume it, it's the guy who swept the floor. You know, in a legal sense, a custodian is somebody who takes care of things. So also there are membership lists in a church, communicant lists. There are, they have, I'm sure all church have names of members of the congregations, a date, look for a date on the list, and it may give when they became a member of that church, the date of removal or dismissal, the name of the spouse, where the person came from, the church town. I can tell you reading William Bradford and John Winthrop's journals is, they talk about people who just showed up and had no referral for walking into town. It wasn't just that they dared to walk into the church. Oh, maybe that is me, I thought. <laughs> oh, there's Brian, he's back in town. Um, they, again, when we were, Larry's right, we're talking about they were very controlling in Plymouth and Boston in, in, in that era. Oh. Very controlling. And you read, that's the other thing, it's not like they wrote about Plymouth later because some other guy wrote about the Mayflower and he researched it. No, these guys were writing about their day-to-day goings-on. And they were very opinionated. Bradford, less so than Winthrop. Winthrop was an opinionated twat, and as he got <laughs> older, he was pissed that they didn't make him governor for life. And he wrote about it. There's another interesting list you can find in churches in the past was uh, they used to publish an annual list of contributors and how much they contributed. Mm -hmm. You can get a sense of the economic level of uh, your ancestors. Well, I think that was more in the Catholic Church than a lot of the other. Oh, that's just what I'm thinking of. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's not so long ago. I mean, I think at one year I gave fifty cents. My, my <laughs> wife was quite incensed when she found her name with the listing of what she gave the Catholic Church mm -hmm. one time in the in the register. She is not. She's out of town. They put it in the newspaper. Yes. <gasps> And that's sort of when she stopped going. Because <laughs> she felt it was between her and God how much she gave the church. Yeah. Yeah. And it is. It is. It well, is, really. Yeah. Oh, wow. These are all the kinds of lists, paperwork, and records that you might be able to find. And um, our church is willing to give this information. That's the next question. Oh. <laughs> some are, some are. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> with nowadays with the computer and all that's going on. You never really want to give up. I mean, that's I guess that's, that's the whole right. bottom line. And you want to start thinking outside the box. So we had a family story in my wife's family in which one of her grandmothers was supposedly abandoned as a child and given okay. to the Catholic Orphanage okay. in Toledo, Ohio. So you go down to the Catholic or Orphanage on Cherry Street and it's something else now and you talk to some of the local Catholic churches around there and they're sort of, you know, that's old stuff and you have to go look, you know, and it's, you know, you know, not being Catholic and not having the, how much, did many ask, how much do I pay to get this? not really wanting to offend anybody outside the box. Well, in Ohio, anyway, there's three or four different repositories around the state that 
take old records. So one day on a lark, I went to Bowling Green State University, went upstairs, got a grad student, and we went through record after record after record until I found the ledger book of all the kids taken during mm. the years I was looking for. Listed the girl's name, listed her uh, confirmation name, date of birth, her mother because she was born illegitimate, the place she was born in Germany, when she was baptized, and who she was released to. So you just never give wow. up. Start wow. start the thinking. The lesson here is 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 if this if this thing went out of business, where might re the records be? And mm -hmm. a lot of states sometimes will take those records and put them into the state archives. The lesson is also don't give up, but also the fact is if you realize the breadth of the kind of records that these groups might keep, <coughs> instead of just saying, oh, can I see your records? You could ask the question is, I'm wondering if you kept membership net records or whatever to, to and uh, not just birth and death and marriage, because um, one of the other thing is, pew or seat records. Members pay for a pew or seat in the church yeah, it's a and help support it. So that also puts your family member someplace at a certain time, which may also be a, a backdoor clue to finding other things. And again, and it's like Larry said, if you know the church existed and you got that far and they don't exist now, yeah, where might those records go? Because people kept records, churches kept, kept records. records. And, and typically they kept records not because they were nice guys, but because there was an economic reason to do so. If you knew who your congregation was, well then you, can, you would get donations and they would be members, they would help they would come to the church barbecue. It's like us, you know, if we know who our we people are, we invite them. We, we, we're not only networking, but we're, we're supporting each other in our efforts. And, and that's why you kept records. So there it is. And I ask that because our church that we belong to now, uh, on their monthly pub uh, publication, that used to have a lot of personal things. They have stopped doing that in this because it's online, and uh, it's it's diff it's interesting, but it's lost that personal because they don't they don't write uh, full names and uh, I mean nothing that's gonna tell you anything. You well, know, basically, I and it's sad because yeah. uh, it's lost the warmth of. Uh, the closeness of the, like a church congregation type thing. But they have to get into a smaller town. That, you know, as long as it's online, it's, uh, the, you've well, got to be afraid of what... Uh, not, every, not everything is online. No, well, it sure isn't. Well, sometimes, sometimes uh, I'm Lutheran, and uh, the, the Lutheran church... The Lutheran churches belong to a larger organization of churches in this country and that help uh, these organizations help well do a variety of things but among other things they they also help get when your pastor retires why so help you get a new one uh, but they also ask, they also kind of, I'm not sure how much pressure there is, but they, they say you will, part of, part of the, pa the pastor's job is to keep records for that congregation. That's part of their duties and that's what they're trained to do. They may not like it, but. And they may put it off until the last day before they leave, <laughs> but uh, they put down all the births, marriages, and deaths. 
Can anyone get those records? <laughs> well, uh, it depends. Depends. they've got a book. Yeah. I mean, they've literally got a, a ledger book that has the pre-printed forms in it, and uh, now, you, you just write on the you just write it on the line. Our church has a monthly report that they give to the regional church, so those records are then kept there. Yeah, I'm not sure. If the pastor's doing the uh, monthly report, but certainly an annual one. But when did they start? Yeah. <laughs> what year yeah. did that start? Right, right. <laughs> um, well, <clears throat> it's been done for <coughs> at least the last uh, 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, our congregation was founded in 1920, so. Uh, the uh, records that go back years. to in the 30s. I'm not sure if it goes all the way back to 1920. You know what? Your church is almost 100 years old. Well, that's the thing. Um, what kind of challenges are getting those records? You know, um, uh, along with that, uh, in, you know, in today's climate, uh, church attendance has decreased Damn. significantly. And a lot of parishes or congregations have uh, uh, combined. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, trying to find, I still haven't found my dad's little infant sister. Who died. <coughs> but uh, the church where I think they were at is administered by another church in a nearby town that uh, right now they, he administers three different parishes. Mm -hmm. So go to the parish that's administering that area for records. So you have to hunt around a little bit. Yeah. Well, in the Catholic Church, they don't necessarily, well, they have parish, but they have, uh, they have hier hierarchies. So the parish and the diocese. And in the Catholic Church, ultimately, it's the Vatican. It's administratively, yeah. But the records are staying with the parish. Yeah, but that to me is kind of a clue, is that the Pope divines how things get divvied up. B because the, just the history of the Northwest, and he decided it would be Walla Walla. So the Pope and the Vatican in Italy is deciding, well, Geographically, Walla Walla and Oregon City and Vatican Island. Well, that makes a nice triangle, and we'll have people there, there, and there. Well, Walla Walla was really wild, apparently, and so then that's why it went to Vancouver, Clark County, which was still Oregon Territory. So, you, when you're looking for it, the notion is that whatever denomination you're looking at, you have to link exactly, are they affiliated in administratively with other groups? Before you do that, you got who your ancestor religion might be, and where are the church records available for research? So in a small town, if that's where your ancestor was born, Larry said his growing up, you know, he could, you probably see the church where everybody hung out, and, yeah, and well, you knew. Yeah, you, yeah, you knew was, everybody. I mean, it was visible. All, yeah, all 45 people went there. Yeah, it was visible. <laughs> well, that solves that. Just get on a bus and go back home. Oh, yeah, that's, that's trouble. Mine is all back here. Back yeah, in Wisconsin. So we we don't have that. We all live out here in the West. We have people yeah. that there. Get on there. So we go on the internet, and um, I went the last time a few years ago. <laughs> we get on the internet, and one of the things, all the people that I searched. Uh, said on the internet, go to familysearch.org, go to Ancestry, but also Google. Google your church denomination. Uh, use the Red Book also to see when their records start. But they'll also maybe give you a background of where to seek an account, a geographic area, more information and who to go to. Somebody else said, I think it's Larry said, 
when you go to a small town, look for the local historian. Well, particularly overseas, but yeah. Yeah, but, but here too there's a possibility. I, I know people in, the, but these are smaller towns. I think more on the East Coast than on the West Coast. In a large city, uh, look for the, the denomination or the church your ancestor attended. You, so Google it and go, if you know he went to the Catholic Church and he lived in New York City, well, maybe he went to St. Patrick's. Maybe he was a, it, it's right there in uh, Upper West Side, and you can see it. But they Google it, you'll find something. That's a start. Well I, well, I just sort of remember it. If you're looking for Dutch, Reformed Dutch and German churches in Manhattan and Bronx, you can find that on the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society. You can just Google that and it'll come up. And the other good place to go is the New York, again, Google it, I don't have the, I don't have the link, the New York Jewish Genealogical Association. They have records pertaining not only to Jewish records, but to a lot of the other older stuff. And it's really JewishGen.org. There you go. That's, yeah. that is, that's one of the better places. Yeah. Um, in New York, go to the main library for two reasons. It's the one with the lions. <laughs> it is so cool. <laughs> the entry to the New York Public Library has these huge lion statues. But you go to their history room. It is amazing. And they have computers and they have Wi-Fi and you plug in and they, it's, it's, uh, it's deep deep history there. So that's a place if you're in New York in a big city. But every big city has, uh, start with where you're going, start with your denomination and see what the, the internet will tell you. Um, family search and <laughs> ancestry, you cannot <coughs> search by a person's name for this kind of information. You must go <coughs> to their wiki or their catalog and you have to search the area and see what they've got in books and what's in print. So family search especially which is the catalog to the, to the library in Salt Lake, that's what you're doing. You, you, you're not <coughs> going to find your person listed separately from a church list, what you're going to find is a church. And does that church have records that are available or that the, the family search people have scooped up, digitized, and, and saved and preserved? So, so they're, not, cannot, they're not indexed by name? No. Correct. Okay. They're indexed by entity, by church, by denomination. What you're going to find is the clues on where to go to find them. And you're doing a good old days search. Yes, yes. Um, the, the trick of ancestry and family search, yeah, they saved a lot of stuff, but truly they don't have everything, maybe 20% of the total human records Maybe that much, probably not. Um, there's a lot of records that are still in closets that are in somebody's back den. There are pastors who retire and said, oh, I, I need to keep the book safe because the church doesn't have a new one. I'll give it to the next guy and he gets ill and forgets, <coughs> you know, what he has. And it sits there, and, and they're burying him, and somebody said, oh, what's this? Yes, um, those things happen, and uh, that's a small town situation. But again, um, I like Larry's thing is think outside the box. Somebody had to do something somewhere, and you need to track them down. The... Um, There's a book out there 
um, how to find your family history in U.S. church records uh, that was published just this year. It's on Ancestry. I got a lot of background information from uh, the Survey of American Churches by uh, Kay Kirkham, but that was printed in 1959. Um, this new one by uh, Harold Henderson and Sonny Jane Morton is rather a great deal more re uh, recent. So um, what's your logic when you're searching? What I found is, hello, hello. Um, the other thing about going to a big city, which you don't find in a small city, you're not going to look for, you may not look for your church, but have you looked in city directories? We have city directories here. There are more city directories at our library and at the museum. City directories were built, built by, um, what's this one? Polk. Polk, yeah. You open it up and everybody's listed. Their street address. Now that may be a gold mine of information, because it might also tell you what church they're close to. So you know they were there, um, and they may even have uh, other information. I, I believe that they have businesses in here. This That's what it's all about, business directories. They might even have churches in there listed. Um, The National Directory of Churches, Synagogues, and Other Houses of Worship is a, a source you can go look at and Google that. There's the official Catholic Directory. Uh, churches are, yeah, it says right here, city directories. Churches are usually listed in the front. City histories. What's the history of the area? Get a big picture. On a map. You know, churches are marked on maps. You can mm -hmm. get out our road map. Churches are there. Where church okay. marriage were or should be. I think Larry pointed out a real obvious thing. Uh, in a small town, churches are where you live. And so if you're in a small area or in an area and you have a map, look and see how close they are. So check the closest records first. Um, also, newspapers. Who said, oh, who said that their donations, you said that family dono donations were listed in a newspaper. Now, I think that's well, kind of... Well, the church publication. Huh? So Larry was saying... <laughs> Somebody else said it was <coughs> their donations in the public. Well, newspaper, yeah, Larry. Newspapers can be in the public domain. Um, in the modern era, uh, I'm sure churches keep record and they have, uh, like Eric pointed out, they may be part of a bigger group. And so, uh, that could be a way to help you find churches or people in another area before you go. My feeling is the last thing you have to do, and I don't know if this is helping Larry find his obscure Baptist, but of all the members around here, this guy has been uh, hop a plane and go talk to people face to face more than, than most of us have done. And that is likely you do all the research and use the clues that you have and be methodical about it. Look at every line. Read it all. I, I, I feel like um, census records are so useful and I realized that when I first realized the use of census records, I go, oh, there's my guy, oh, God. slap, stop, 19, whatever, I got it. And there's a whole line of information. Same thing with church records. 
they, look at all this stuff. There is a huge amount of information on every line. Um, if this weren't Dolly's ancestor, I wonder if she would have figured it out. They didn't even spell their names the same. Duh. And so the form is in Latin. The writing is in a hand that is not in vogue. And um, I think, I think she said, Peter, oh, Peter was not Peter. And, and, and Peter had a brother who was named Paul in America, but he was Polona elsewhere. So uh, there is that thing. So Peter, Peter was not his? Petrus. His birth yeah, no. name? No, Petrus. Well, his last name was Petrus, but Peter had, he had a different name. Before and the priest there. didn't know that? No, no, he changed it. That is what he used oh. in the New World. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? And um, and I got from an insider, the priest didn't often care what you told your name was. <laughs> and I go, oh, well. They operate a certain amount of trust. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, um, <laughs> I, I think the one thing that can be said for church records is there were people, and there's a lot of handwriting, um, but they did uh, use forms as, as much as as anybody, mm -hmm. but still, there were people handwriting this information, asking the questions. You had to be patient, they keeping their records. Um, put all this together. So look at every single clue when you're going. Now, for Larry's Baptist Church, I suspect, Larry, you've already been walked the walk where the church was. I've been to the town, but the church no longer exists. That's what I mean. <clears throat> that's the, that sort of gets to be the problem. Is is uh, see, because after you do all this online, yeah. the rest of us we're taking you as our guide. You you're going to have if if that's what you really want to know and need to know to do your going forward, you probably have to get on. The bus, the train, the plane. It, it really, walk it, the walk. I guess it really depends train. on what you personally are looking for. Exactly. If if family lore and really skimpy information suffice it enough for your personal belief that you that Benjamin Park had a son named Jahiel and they lived in Schuyler, mm -hmm. then that's fine. But if for some reason you want to establish a true documentation of that, that would stand up to genealogical scrutiny, then that's going to take a lot more than, than you know. So it, it's for me, on, at least on that family now, it's it's and I have you know it's getting the time to do it. It's going down the DNA list. To all the cousins I can find and write him a letter saying do you have a letter do you have anything that you use to prove this or did you just say like a lot of us have done oh Bonanza it's on ancestry.com and in the old days you could go oh I've just filled in 37,000 different people <laughs> Just because somebody added the name on family service. Yes. <laughs> and as, as we all probably have found out sooner or later. Uh, yeah, it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, delete, 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 <laughs> delete, 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 delete. So, exactly. I mean, it, it's. These are all clues. Yeah. And in some cases, you, you may never really know. Well. <laughs> oh, 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 you, you are fast. Wow. <laughs> Good for you. 
<laughs> and your frustration increases <laughs> the level of, it, of information that you want. And before long, you go up. Oh, and he smashed the thing I'll on just, the table. <laughs> I'll just start with, no, I didn't mash it. He hit this way, so the concussion of the air killed him. <laughs> Wait, was that Herman? No, it just makes him go dead. Marcia, are you going to keep a record? A lot of, of these <laughs> denominations <laughs> have he archivists. Yes. At their at their headquarters, and sometimes regionally, yeah. which is a possibility for finding documents. The question is pertinent. How far does it make you happy to want to go? Yeah, that's. And if you want to go, then you must do what we always talk about: is methodically chart your course and think about all the possibilities logically. All these churches have branches, dioceses, parishes, neighbors, mergers, divisions. They come, they go, they're in a region. A lot of it you can start your methodical search online and you can get closer and narrow the box. And if you finally go, and it's not there anymore. <laughs> Here's the next thing, though, with that. You just put it on your back burner because times change. And when I started doing this 25 years ago, I was handwriting stuff like whoever else was doing it. Now I have a database, and now we have these, these online sources, and they they do keep adding things and you just keep adding. The other thing is, that was pointed out by one of our speakers is, people still find stuff in old houses, mm -hmm. in back rooms of libraries. You can't predict when it's going to happen. So, um, yeah. But it does and folks are digitizing and sharing. So, and finally, this whole DNA thing, not finally, but <coughs> part of it is, this whole DNA thing does open up an avenue of conversation with people. And again, uh, we might be cousins. Do you, do you know about the church? Do you know, do you know about this person, this other person that you might share information with? And the other thing that I found that DNA is really most helpful with, it, a couple of days ago, you get, I got a random email from someone saying, I think we're related. Um, you and I match on jedmatch.com, which is a DNA matching system. So she had a big tree, I had a big tree, we put them both together and we found where we match. So now I know that my grandfather, who his grandfather probably is, because that's, there's no other way for this woman and I to match other than that one point of intersection. It's a triangulation. So it's not good enough for me to join the Mayflower Society on or anything else, but at least I know that link is true. The problem gets to be is that his dad and mother, for whatever reason, left the church in Connecticut and either A, moved, or B, went to another church and didn't keep records, or whatever. Now, the true genealogist will say they only had five children because those five children were listed in the church records. The other three kids, they didn't have. Those kids just someplace else. Well, now we know at least one of those three kids should belong to that five group. So now it's the case of trying to find... It wasn't the biology, it was the record keeping. Yeah, it's trying to find A, where, where dad and the kids went to. Perhaps they went from Connecticut to New York because that's where the next generation died. They all died in upstate New York, so it's... it's you it's, also know that they weren't dunkers because they did probably get... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't hear about Dunkard's. <laughs> no, I, I, I think the ones that didn't prop give are called shakers. <laughs> yeah, but we still hear about their furniture. <laughs> yeah. But the, there was, well, the shakers made furnitures too, but they didn't. 
they didn't. They yeah, the shakers, the, the, the furniture we do, it's pretty valuable now. Really, is the sh are shakers the ones that did Rob again? I don't know, was it the Oneida? Well, they were in Ohio, weren't they? Also. Oneida? I don't know. But uh, there was some PBS schedule about the last of a, of a don denomination yeah. that didn't marry and he and <laughs> ended with it. Well, he was still hopeful that somebody might join his church. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought, well, no, not two, not two. Well, what's, uh, I, I, I would have to say I don't quite understand what, how he marketed his, uh, his church aspirations, you know, when, you know, what were the uh, benefits of membership? Did they have, you know? Then you contrast that type of an attitude with uh, the early Mormon philosophy of polygamy. Yeah. It's totally opposite. Religion can do what you want it to do. Yeah. Well, but um, apparently that came about because there were more women than men. It was an economic thing, I think. Well, to some degree, but it also came about... Somebody had a good idea. Yeah. Well, there was a, there was <laughs> somebody, it was probably a man's idea. Yeah, well, there, there well were, apparently they weren't the was. first in the history of humans. No, and they weren't, again, like you said, they weren't the first. and and. There is another today mainstream religion that, depending where you live in the world, practices polygamy quite, oh, quite yeah. openly. Um, if you go way, way back, you know, to the Bible, it says someplace in there, if your if your brother should die, you should take his wife and look after, and so on and so forth. So it's that's sort of where they 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 get. It involved in the religion. That has a very broad interpretation, I understand. However, Mrs. Brigham wasn't so happy. No. No. She made his life somewhat uncomfortable when he decided to choose other women. Mm -hmm. um, you mean the first Mrs. Brigham? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then sometime when they had the difficulties in Missouri and Missouri ordered ordered the uh, eradication of the Mormons and they moved, the church actually, actually split over that issue. And you have the reformed LDS church, which is based, I think, in Wisconsin. That's where a bunch of those people went. Of the My grandmother was, was LDS. She was a true believer and her claim was is that she married a guy named a page after her first husband died. Mr. Page was the ringleader of the group that wanted to split, wanted to do away with polygamy. <coughs> and he was excommunicated and he started his own church. And she was given the option, she could choose to go with her husband and be excommunicated, or she could divorce him and be alone with four or five small children. She divorced him. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then trucked to Nauvoo, Illinois, and wanted to go west to the Promised Land. And they told her that unmarried women with children were not really welcome in the Promised Land because they were a burden. She didn't conform at all. Hmm? She didn't conform. So, being the no. person who really wanted to go, and she'd already been through at least two, maybe three men by this time. She goes, you single? <laughs> and went west. <laughs> and then she hit Utah and go, we're divorced. Did she go around three times? I don't know, but you know, she, was, she was married several times. So. She had an agenda. Yeah, she did. She knew wow. What she wow! 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 We—it took us 15 years of searching to find her unmarked grave in Salt Lake wow. City, and we finally got our marker for her. us and a, I and a bunch of other of her descendants. Amazing. Amazing. Partly is because she had so many husbands, five, and so many names she used, depending on the whim. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, pretty cavalier. Cavalier. Sounds like a scamp. <laughs> pretty cavalier. Uh, well, any other words of wisdom? Well, I'll just share. <laughs> Last week, uh, I had a career in IT, so I need to have all my T's crossed and I's dotted and I could make a, I have two great great grandmothers whose maiden names I've been hunting for a year at least. One of them, Eureka! Mm. <laughs> and I could make a really good case of tracing her from England over here with her father and living blah blah blah, and, but I just didn't have that. And so uh, next month or in two weeks I'm going to um, lower eastern New York State to um, southeast to do some research and one is Rockland County so I contacted their genealogy society and you know can I get some help and uh, this one woman googled it was a newspaper it wasn't newspaper.com it was this other free site that was kind of more local news and there was two-line marriage of Luke Newsom to Judith Oldroy just and that's the name I wanted so <laughs> Great. That was great. Yeah. Super. Wow. Talking to the right people who know where to look. Exactly. A lot of times. And the local people. Yeah. We, we went to um, a small town out of Cedar Rapids and um, looking for some research. And we went to the Genealogy Society, which was only open like two days a week for four hours or something. But there was a number on the on the door, so we called them and we went to the library and they called somebody and ended up some lady comes in from her. She was out farming that day, but she took the time off to come in to the genealogy society, open it up for us, and she knew the people, she knew the places, yeah. she knew where to find the records, and it was a wealth of information, and then she just answered a million questions yeah. for us. Yeah. And if we would have just looked and said, oh, it's closed and moved on, we wouldn't have got any of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, we are preparing to go to Salt Lake City, and that's one of the things. So the same thing applies to church records. Before you get on the train, the plane, or the bus, research where you're going, call and see who's open and who can help you further. See what hours they're there. I mean, it's like it's just okay. Seems so common sense, but you know, I feel like when I decide I'm going to go someplace, the biggest thing is, oh, damn, can I get the plane reservation? And you know, to the city where I want to go, and I just, in my <coughs> mind when I'm here, it never seems a big problem <laughs> that you'll, you'll hook up when you're there. Uh, often little things happen. People have gone places, and you go halfway around the world to look up there, and there's, oh, close. I've, I've learned close to look for at the, lunch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've learned to look at the dates that they're open mm -hmm. before we go, so we can kind of. The other thing is, um, I, I want to go to Edinburgh, Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland. August is the tattoo. Mm -hmm. Apparently, and I'm going, gee, it seems awfully expensive to stay oh, in yes Edinburgh it is. in August. It's the tattoo for the whole month. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everything's what going on. Yes. What is that? It's it's no, the military. It's not yeah. military. It's the the presenting of all the bands. The oh. it, yeah, the clans. And the clans. It's it's a tattoo. Yes, it's the clans. It's all these men with bagpipes, drum, and short kilts. Yeah. Many of them are regimental. <laughs> well, there are regimental, but there are community ones. There yeah. are youth ones. We have a Fort Vancouver pipe band here in Clark County. And um, my youngest grandson was so excited about when we went to the Highland Games in Enumclaw. He, when he first saw him, he kind of hung back. He was real quiet. And they were, it was in the area they were competing. So they, they pipe in, and then they compete. They play the piece, and they're judged, and people are in grandstands. But as we went around the fairgrounds, we went to the far end, and Isaac realized he could walk right up to those guys mm -hmm. and he come on and he, he, could, he was so enthralled so I thought you know he's three but he's so interested I wanted to know more about it and they give lessons 
if you want to join their group or, or they give lessons of, of the bagpipe and the drums. Mm -hmm. I learned there are three kinds of drums, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> and so I went and saw the practice and to see how it comes. And so uh, I think my grandson would really be enthused. He's too young to do it, but my I said now Grant. His father, my son, does things with Isaac, and Isaac watches whatever his dad does. And so I said, so I think Isaac really likes those drums, Grant. <laughs> and if you got one... Little kids like yeah. drums. Yeah. Yeah. Little kids <laughs> like drums, yes. And so and I, I said, I don't want to buy him a <laughs> plastic <laughs> pootsie thing. So he told me that uh, he plays the guitar at home, and Isaac likes to strum this, the, the pluck the things in a manner that's not really good for the instrument, but you know, <laughs> he seems to like it, so. Yeah, so I like bagpipes and drummers and well, all Marcia, that stuff. <laughs> I spent uh, two years in Scotland defending it in the U.S. Navy. So before you go to Edinburgh, let me know and I'll give you a couple good pub names. <laughs> Did you leave your name on the wall? <laughs> no, I was never got that high. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yes. If you go, we went in May, I think, and the, the rates are really pretty reasonable. Yeah. And um, me not knowing any place about where to go, I went with a genealogical tour group out of Canada. They didn't get from Canada, put it all together, and we flew over. Cool. She did all the legwork. So we spent, out of that week, we spent like three or four days in the main library going through all their records. But we learned more by going to a little place called um, Scotland's People. And you can find them online, just Google them. It, it does sound familiar. And that's just a, like a, it's almost like a little bookstore in the back, but it's run by a bunch of volunteer quasi-professional genealogists. They're volunteers up till the point where it gets really starting to deep, then they become, mm -hmm. if you really want us to really look, it's going to cost you some, some money. Yeah. But um, we had some pretty good records. I mean, we, we did, I did really well. And the Green Mile is uphill, down, and back. <laughs> He knows about me. <laughs> well, uh, they used to stand at the tension while they played both national anthems. Oh, come on. And the pipe band went by. <laughs> well, YouTube has become my new best friend. And um, since I haven't been able to, you know, run off to Scotland this week, you know, all you got to do is put in search pipe bands and they all come up on YouTube. And they're marching through town and they're they're showing up, they got it, it's just, but the reality is, if you go to any of the Highland Games and enjoy when they do the massing of the bands, we typically get a seat right on the front row and uh, we get our beach chairs, and because you have to wait until they finally do it, and they're right up, and it's like my friend and I we used to sit, our nose was right <laughs> at <laughs> kill him level. <laughs> And and, the, and there's the, that old question every, every time. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but there is no sound on a recording as big as that moment of being there when they're playing Scotland the Brave or Amazing Grace, marching up and down. There is nothing that big. So you, eventually, you got to go, and that's with genealogy search. Eventually, you'll have to go. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, and thank yes. you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Marsha. Marsha. Thank you. Marcia. Thank you. We're going to rate this on a scale of 10. <laughs> a 12. Oh, that's very <laughs> sweet. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, guys.